Um, so tonight's program, 50 States of Mind, A Journey to Rediscover American Democracy, it's sponsored by the Friends of the Thomas Green Public Library, so thank you to them. Um, and it's really my pleasure to introduce our guest speaker and author for this evening. So Ryan received his master's degree from the University of Oxford, where he graduated with honors and received distinction for his narrative nonfiction account of his American travels, 50 States of Mind, A Journey to Rediscover American Democracy. And he's also a contributor for The Infatuation, has been published in USA Today, The Fulcrum, The Oxford Political Review, and has worked with Conan and The Onion. My favorite trivia, he's also a Slytherin contestant on the quiz show Harry Potter, Tournament of Houses. I'm a Slytherin too, so hello. Oh my gosh. <laughs> um, Brian is currently the senior managing editor for the Trevor Project, overseeing editorial strategy to end suicide among LGBTQ young people. Brian, welcome to the library. Oh, well, thank you so much for having me, Rosie. And it's a real pleasure for me to be here. I say at every single one of these libraries that you think you're coming here to learn something from me, but actually it's quite the opposite. Whether I'm in Maine or Wisconsin, I walk away having learned something from you. And thank you for showing up tonight because I'm not sure if you've noticed, there are so few forums through which to have conversations about our democracy. It's either on social media, and we know how that goes, or it's uh, at a dinner table with our family. It's very rare that we get to sit down with our community and actually have a conversation about the very important work of what's going on in our democracy. So I always start off with a very short reading from the book, uh, just to kind of level set what we're going to talk about today, but don't worry, I don't read too long. And this is the preface from 50 States of Mind, A Journey to Rediscover American Democracy. The pulse of America is elusive. There is no steady beat. There is only the erratic rhythm of a people with very little shared history constantly rediscovering how to live together. Despite this, I, a staffer from a failed 2016 presidential campaign, read Democracy in America in graduate school, found inspiration in Alexis de Tocqueville's travels, and decided to follow in his footsteps nearly 180 years after his book's publication. I hit the road to talk to Americans of all stripes with a grant for my graduate program at the University of Oxford, I drove 23,257 miles to visit over 150 cities, towns, and villages in all 50 states. I wanted to find answers to the defining questions of the era. Does American democracy still work? Can we still coexist peacefully? Why are we so divided? Do we like? being divided? Amidst the horror of national headlines, I wasn't expecting to find something optimistic on the ground. I wasn't expecting to have to question my own place in our democracy. And I certainly wasn't expecting to find myself living somewhere new at the end of it. After the 2016 election, I wanted to understand the complicated country I lived in and where I fit into it. The question of what it means to be an American has always been difficult in a country so full of various cultures and viewpoints, let alone during such a polarized time. To accurately portray America's staggering diversity, I pushed myself to meet people from all walks of life. My mission was to listen, not teach, to learn, not lecture, and my only methodology was the desire to find someone unlike anyone else I had met before. I stayed in the homes of people across the country who opened their doors to me. In turn, I responded with an open mind and a generous ear. If I hadn't, this trip would not have been possible. This mindset also gave me space to learn what I didn't know about the diverse perspectives across our country. I found a surprising amount of common ground, and it became my belief that building bridges, even with those with whom we initially seemed to disagree, could be our last line of defense against a quickly radicalizing society. The breakdown of candid dialogue benefited only the powers profiting off our division and outrage. 
lest we realize how much we actually agree on. The late great Secretary of State, Madeleine Albright, crystallized the dangers of our political environment in her book, Fascism, A Warning. At many levels, contempt has become a defining characteristic in American politics. It makes us unwilling to listen to what others say, unwilling in some cases, even to allow them to speak. This stops the learning process cold and creates a ready-made audience for demagogues who know how to bring diverse groups of the aggrieved together in righteous opposition to everyone else. With her words in mind, I consciously tried to rid myself of any vestige of self-righteousness or contempt as I allowed my preconceived notions to be challenged by my fellow Americans. I hope you'll have your preconceived notions challenged too. Only then can we see what is within the bounds of normalcy and what is dangerous extremism and be able to recognize the latter when we see it. Ultimately, American democracy is made up of unique states of mind and stories that inform every citizen's worldview. By deciding to start with the people, I was reminded that America is a community existing together in a shared moment with far more in common than that which divides us. We have so much to learn from each other. I hope this book can take you on a journey to challenge your understanding of the United States through the small interactions I had with people all across the nation. By offering a sampling of the staggering diversity in America, I hope you experience the wonders, contradictions, oddities, and thrills of 50 very different states of mind. Every time I read this, I think I'm going to find a typo. <laughs> I've read it maybe 30 times out loud. I'm like, this is the time that I'm going to find a the, the democracy or something like that. It didn't happen this time. Relieved. Excellent editors. I'm sure. Yes, yes. The best. That was fantastic. Thank you for sharing. Thank you. I had so many thoughts and just like reliving my own experiences as we touched before this. And in addition to uh, before I came to the library, I worked both in the 2016 and the 2020 elections. And I think one of my favorite parts was building those communities and just trying to inform people how empowering voting is and how being able to share just what really matters to you as a human is just such like a freeing experience. One of the things that I was curious about was you touched on it in the preface, this really seemed like a pilgrimage to you. Can you tell us a little bit about what set you down this path to begin with? Well, Rosie, I'm so glad you have organizing experience because it is very much the inciting incident of this book. Uh, working on the 2016 campaign was the best job in the world for me. And I know you understand field organizing is a dream job because you wake up every day and you go out and talk to people about democracy. You talk to them about their hopes and dreams for this country. And I had the opportunity to speak with dairy farmers in Iowa, senior citizens in New York, Haitian immigrants in Florida every day at community events, uh, political events, or even just on someone's front porch talking to them about what's on their mind. And I think after the 2016 election happened and my candidate lost, I moved to New York and suddenly I was very isolated. I didn't get to talk to people about what was going on in the country. The only way I could understand the story of America was to watch the news or to watch my news feeds or to see a social media feud that went nowhere. And so I became obsessed with this idea of the story of America. And so I did what any person who's obsessed does. They write an admissions essay to a, a grad program. So I applied to the University of Oxford in the UK. And to my surprise, I got in. And I got to leave the United States behind and not think about American democracy anymore for about three days. <laughs> I got over there. And immediately, I was annoying all of my British friends with late night pub assessments of what was going on in America. And they had political problems of their own at the time, and I guess now. Uh, so I was like, how do I channel this amazing opportunity of being in the UK to study into something constructive? And so I decided to leave the United Kingdom and go back to the United States. I came up with this idea of traveling to all 50 states in the style of Alexis de Tocqueville to understand American democracy, kind of like you had on the campaign trail and what, what I had as well. And so I went to my department with this idea of traveling to all 50 states 
thoroughly expecting that they would say, Ryan, that's completely unrealistic. You need to whittle it down to something more manageable. Instead, they said, sounds good, Ryan. Go ahead and travel to all 50 states. I was like, I'm sorry, what? I, I don't have any money. I don't have any way to get around. So they gave me a small grant. And that ended up being the greatest gift because I had to rely on the generosity of the American people. I went to my social media and I said, please help me. I've signed up for this mad dash across all 50 states. Can anyone host me anywhere? And the outpouring of interest and love was astounding. People said, you know, my cousin is building solar panels on the roofs of houses in West Virginia. You've got to stay with her. Or um, my friend from college is doing something amazing in Casper, Wyoming. You have to go meet her. And all of a sudden, I realized that everyone wanted me to see the best of America. And I had places to stay in nearly all 50 states. And I think sitting at people's dinner tables, it was, first of all, harder to pick and choose who I could stay with. Say, I'm sorry, before you give me this free place to stay, um, how did you vote in the last election? Uh, how do you feel about this particular issue? I didn't have that luxury. And this was a very different approach than a lot of celebrities took after the 2016 election, where they'd show up with a camera crew and film a, a real quick conversation and then go stay in a five-star hotel. I actually got to sit down with people and have conversations at, at their dinner table. And I realized very quickly that conversations about politics quickly became conversations about democracy human stories, the job that someone had lost, the child that someone had lost, the exciting new business that had just moved onto their main street that's revitalizing their community, or the friendship that had been fractured over politics. That's what people were really interested in when I sat at their dinner tables across the country. I really love that. That's such a fantastic answer. Um, that kind of leads me to my next question. Um, Myself, I'm sure you and many people here, I grew up in a very politically divided household. You don't talk about politics, you're just going to upset people. Um, but I think that that's really the heart of what America and American democracy is. We were founded so that we could talk about issues, so that we could be drawn to different types of communities. It really inspired me to want to go to all 50 states. Um, I know that someone who works a nine to five is a little tricky. How do you, maybe can others draw inspiration from what you've done with this trip, with this book and its message? Maybe they can't go to every state right now, um, but maybe are there any tips or insights you can offer for people that want to kind of embrace this type of energy and mantra? I'll give you three tips, three and a half. Okay, this one's easy. If you want to buy the book and <laughs> uh, see what I discovered across the country, the, the point I want to make about the book is it's really not about me. It's really about trying to showcase Americans across the country, and not just mayors and governors, they're in there too, but regular people across the country that you may not have the opportunity to meet in Ohio or West Virginia or Florida. And that's very much what the, the hope of the book is. There's also an audio book and a companion podcast where people can actually hear the voices of the people I interviewed in the book, because some of them are so good, I thought people would say, you made this up. I'm like, no, 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 there's, there's audio, and it's, it's real people. It's not AI either. Um, so that's a, free, a freebie. The first thing that I tell everyone is be open to good news in your community. There's a lot of bad news out there that we hear every single day. And we have huge issues that we're up against. I'm not blind to that fact. But I think sometimes we feel like we need to carry the burden of all of the bad news that's happening all the time. And we create lenses through which we see our communities, where we, we can only see the bad news. But there's a lot of good happening in our communities all across the country. There are amazing people that are trying to make a difference every day. There are amazing arts organizations, nonprofits, businesses that are actively trying to make life better for people across this country. So that's the first piece of advice. Just be open to the good news across the country. The second thing is we can be tourists in our own community. Uh, you know, I'll probably talk later about how dangerous social media is when mixed with politics, but we can use social media as a conduit to find out about opportunities, to find out about incredible library talks, to find out about organizing opportunities, to find out about ways to engage with our community, because that's the thing that Alexis de Tocqueville really admired about American democracy, the way we formed 
associations, the way we show up, the way we participate in democracy. It is about voting, but it's also about what we do in between the elections to you know, volunteer in our local community, to show up to the PTA, to show up to city council meetings, to actually participate in democracy and meet people from different backgrounds. So we can be tourists in our own community and capture that spirit of traveling to all 50 states just by showing up places we wouldn't normally where we live. And the third thing, and this is perhaps more difficult than traveling to all 50 states for some people, one of the great pains for me about this period in American history is the relationships that have been fractured because of the divisiveness of our politics trickling down. Um, I feel like when we forget that our relationships are the most important and valuable currency we have, and we cut those things down, they're like trees. You cut down a relationship that takes 30 years to grow because of politics, it's gonna take 30 years to grow another relationship with that depth. And this is not me advocating for sitting down with your you know, neighborhood neo-Nazi. I'm talking about the people in our lives that we've cut out because the division at the top has trickled down. Um, so I say reach out to someone you might have broken with, and I know it can be really hard, but when you humble yourself and you listen to their story, when you ask them questions about how their worldview is formed, all of a sudden you find that the thing you're arguing about isn't actually what's being argued about. It's about the inability to see someone. And I'll come to this later of what unites people across the country, but hearing people's stories is the most powerful tool we have to change people's perspectives. And if we allow the division in our politics that comes from talking heads on the news, from cynical politicians to divide us, then we let them win. And one thing I do not want is to let those who divide us win anymore. Our friendships, our family relationships, our community relationships are too important to be ruined by something as cheap as the antics of people who don't care about us and we will never meet in our lives. Yeah, <laughs> it, it doesn't sound good with a microphone. <laughs> um, I really couldn't agree more with all of it. I thought those were really helpful tips that we can all take into our own lives. Um, you did touch on the fact that even though we live in such an attention-driven economy and the people at the top really do just want to capitalize on every second of our attention and make it as divisive and angry as possible so that we don't have time to think about our small town communities and how can we possibly make them better or vote, we're just angry all the time. One thing I think that this book really touches on well is you talk to a really wide variety of people with tons of different viewpoints and opinions. Obviously you had a sense of what was different, but really did you come away from this experience with a better sense of what connects us? I know in um, chapter seven you discuss that there's an emerging, an emerging regional inequality in this country. Um, you went. You obviously went to Oxford and you were student at Northwestern. It really would have been acceptable and really expected for you to move to a coastal city or an elite New York type of town, but you chose not to do that. So can you tell us a little bit about what, one, what connects us, and then what influences your decision to not move to where you live now? Absolutely. So the first thing, what unites us, is very basic, actually both things are very basic, but the first thing is everyone wanted me to see the best in their community. When I showed up, it, it wasn't people ragging on where they were from, and actually often in one breath someone would say, you know, this country is going down the tubes. This country is not what it once was, but my community has never been stronger. <laughs> and I just thought it was interesting, the disconnect of those two statements. Uh, our communities are microcosms of our democracy. And when our communities are strong, sometimes that's the, that's the best place to look for the story of America. A uh, little story about me. I'm from a place called Rockford, Illinois. Uh, that's where I grew up. And when I was in high school, it was voted the third most miserable city in America by <laughs> Forbes. We had an unemployment rate of 17.2%. But the thing is, we couldn't let that affect our morale. And living in a town like Rockford, which is the third largest city in Illinois, we had to actually show up to make our institutions work. Nothing was handed to us. And there's an amazing tradition of people in the town I grew up in showing me that 
things aren't going to happen unless you show up to make them happen. You know, arts organizations die if people don't invest their time. Uh, civic institutions don't just happen automatically. You actually have to show up and volunteer to make our schools, to make our cities, to make our nonprofits work. And that is very much the approach I led with going across the country. And I found a lot of kindred spirits. Um, in fact, when I had a few friends come to visit from Oxford a few weeks ago, and they flew into Chicago, and I said, do you want me to come meet you in Chicago? They said, no, 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 no. We want to see Rockford. We want to come to Rockford because of the pride and love with which you talk about that town. And I think it's the same all across the country. If they knew I was an author and I had 24 hours, all of a sudden I was meeting with the most exciting movers and shakers in that town who were actually making a positive impact. And people love their community and they're proud of their community and they want other people to see it too. Um, the second thing, almost sounds kindergarten, almost sounds so dumb to say, but I don't hear anyone else saying it in relation to politics, so I feel like I have to. And that's that everyone just wants to be known and loved. And in this frustrating period where people in politics, people on cable news, intentionally mischaracterize people on the other side, they question their motives, they question their intelligence, they think that you know, they're hell-bent on destroying America, or they say that they do. Um, maybe they don't actually believe that. People feel mischaracterized, and if people think they can never be known, they think they can never be loved. And so if they don't feel they can ever be understood, they just kind of give up trying with people from the other side because they think, okay, this person thinks I'm stupid, this person thinks I'm uh, you know, a communist trying to you know, turn America into a hellscape. It just, it's not a very constructive place to start a conversation. And then uh, you were bringing up the idea of you know, moving to a big town uh, for young people. And I think young people right now feel especially despondent, that there are these issues that are outside of our control, big money in politics. Uh, you know, our politicians don't listen to our voices. Uh, the issues that affect us aren't necessarily what's on the mind of the 80-year-olds who are running the country. So, I'll tell a quick story. When I was a senior in college at Northwestern University in Chicago, um, I know Northeastern is big out here, so I just want to clarify where it is. People would come up to me and say, Ryan, where are you moving after graduation? Are you moving to New York? Are you moving to LA? Or maybe San Francisco or DC? As though there were no other options of where to make a good life, as though that was the only place to fulfill you know, one's potential. And, uh, I fell for it, I moved to New York, and I felt very isolated because I didn't have that same sense of purpose that I grew up with in a town where you had to show up to make things work. And I think for young people especially, one of the antidotes to feeling despondent or feeling like everything is futile is being a part of a community where you can actually see your impact. I'll give you a quick example. When I was traveling around the country, I was in uh, Indianapolis, Indiana, and I met a woman named Joanna Beatty Taft. And Joanna started her professional life in Washington, D.C. Uh, she wanted to make a difference in the arts in D.C., and she was one of hundreds of people who wanted to make a difference in the arts. So it became a very crowded place to make a difference. You know, was, there are only so many board seats. There are only so many leadership positions. And it was only when Joanna and her husband moved to Indianapolis that all of a sudden she became a leader in her field. She could actually open a nonprofit that was aimed at keeping artists in Indianapolis and providing them with opportunities to make a good living. Uh, within three years, she opened up her own school because she moved to a community where it was easier to make an impact. And I think my advice for young people is we have so much to learn from communities across the country, especially communities where it's easier to get a leadership position, where it's easier to get a coffee with someone in a position of authority who can teach you. And then in return, it's easier to fill a part of the economy. It's easier to start an art studio, start a restaurant, start a nonprofit, and actually fulfill your potential. And, uh, for example, if people care a lot about something like uh, high school dropout rates, there's not much we can actually do about the national issue, but you can join a chapter of Big Brothers Big Sisters, which is in all 50 states, and be a mentor to a young person who is then virtually guaranteed to graduate from high school. It's those think globally, act 
locally actions that we can do that actually make a difference. And I'll, I'll tell one more story about the importance of local action. So I was at one of these library events in Amory, Wisconsin, and there was a teacher in the audience who said, you know, Ryan, I'm really concerned about the fraying of our institutions across America. People just aren't showing up like they used to. Robert Putnam wrote this, wrote about this in his book, uh, Bowling Alone, that people aren't showing up to bowling leagues anymore. They're not showing up to the PTA. They're not showing up to church. And she said, and it's so disheartening in my community to show up at basketball games because there used to be lines out the door 30 minutes before the basketball game, and now maybe there's 12 people in the, in the stands. I almost said the audience, but that would be a theater reference. That shows how much I know about sports. Uh, but I said to her, you know, there is nothing you can do about this trend of people not showing up to things nationally. But you can get people to that basketball game. That is within your power. It takes a teacher or a student to mobilize the faculty, the students, and who knows? Maybe that will have a ripple effect beyond. So I just think that if we look at where we can make an impact and we look at our communities as the canvas to make change, we're gonna see returns and we are actually going to feel like we can have an impact. And I think that will make us more hopeful as well. Thank you, I, I really couldn't agree more. And I would also like, when you all leave here today, think about like the areas where it's, you know, I really wish we had a movie theater in town. I wish we had more movie events or book talks or something that you're really passionate about that makes you excited and it doesn't exist. That's, you can do it. There's nothing stopping you. You can come to the library and be like, hey, I haven't seen an event like this. We'll put it on, we, we'd love to. So I think that to your point of like finding your community, it's like one of the best feelings as a young person. I understand similarly, I grew up in New York I, uh, my parents will always tease me, like, how would you leave New York? It's the best city. Like, I just didn't feel at home there. I love my small town in Massachusetts. I don't live in Quincy. I live in Lancaster, which is a really yeah. tiny farm town, but I love it. Um, so speaking of hometowns, can you talk about how one's upbringing or one's hometown or just sense of community can affect their worldview or even political worldview? Absolutely. It's where we come from is everything. And there's a great book by Colin Woodward, The uh, 11 Rival Nations in the US. I'm trying to think of what it's called. Have you, I love that book. What's it called? American Nations. American Nations. The 11 Nation States. It's like Tim knows it. It's, He's reading it now. <laughs> you're reading it right now. What's it called? Oh, she just said the title. OK, perfect, perfect. <laughs> It's a great read for everyone here. It, it talks about the different cultures that formed the United States, essentially. Um, the immigrant communities that came had a certain way of viewing American democracy, and that has trickled down to have an impact today. But where we come from and the values of our hometowns actually impacts us for the rest of our life. And I think this idea of telling people stories means asking, so where did you grow up? Where did you come from? How did that shape your values or your worldview? Because once you actually can understand where someone's coming from, it's, it's this technique that mediators use, right? You let someone get everything off their chest, and then you come back to business, right? That's sort of how we should view politics, understanding where people are coming from and then getting down to business. And changing hearts and minds doesn't mean expecting someone to think exactly like you do. It doesn't mean that they are going to all of a sudden adapt your opinions on everything, but it's about allowing your story, because you always, if you're listening to someone else's story, you should always expect them to listen to your story as well. That should broaden their mind. That should give them additional perspectives to consider when making a political decisions. One of the most beautiful things about life is different perspectives pulling other people into their orbit how we can affect, how we can change each other. And I think in this period where there are so many dividing lines meant to distract us, when everything is controversial, it's not just political issues, now it's cultural issues, it's beer, it's the Barbie movie, it's exhausting. I think everyone feels the same way, and I think if we spend more time talking to people and less time having to have an opinion about every little thing, we will actually have more time to talk to each other. And if we can take the outrage that we are expected to have about all of these cultural issues that don't really matter, and we channel those 
feelings and that energy into our community, I think we're going to have a lot better and brighter future in America. Thank you for that. My next question is a little bit longer, so I'm going to have oh, reading. Oh, okay. <laughs> um, so I've definitely got from our talk earlier and from what you've been saying so far that you're very, it takes a lot of courage, but also a lot of trust to go on this type of adventure, to go on this type of journey, staying at 50 or more strangers' houses across the country. It did seem to serve you pretty well, the characteristic of being trusting um, across your journey. Do you view this trait in yourself as a strength or a weakness, and why? Okay, so I, I mentioned to you at the very top in a, a, something that happened to me, and I'll get there. But uh, when I traveled across the country, staying in people's homes, you have to trust that they're not gonna murder you. You just have to trust that you know when they're offering you uh, you know, their garage or their bedroom or their daughter's bedroom, not when the daughter's there, obviously, but like the, the bedroom of their daughter who's at college or something like that, that they are there and they're, they're showing up in good faith in hosting you. Uh, that lasted the first maybe 70% of the trip where I uh, was fine. Then I went to a town called Truth or Consequences, New Mexico, where I was almost murdered. Uh, this town had a serial killer uh, who killed like 70 people and he had all of these accomplices in the town, like local law enforcement, his daughter, the local bartender. So when I showed up with my friend and we you know, stayed in an Airbnb for the night because the drive was getting long, we went to the local bar and I think they took us for maybe a gay couple or something. So a man sort of started leering at us in the bar. The bartender served us our drinks, a beer flight, and then she was very adamant about us leaving the bar to go outside to look at the solar eclipse or something, which wasn't even happening. We went back in and we felt kind of weird about drinking the drinks we had left unattended. And then this scary man shouted a slur at both of us and we still stayed in the bar. And then finally we left the bar without drinking one of the drinks, thank goodness. And then we got chased around downtown, truth or consequences, in a pickup truck. So the reason I tell this story, the reason I talk about trust is because when I told this story to my friends who were women or, or people of color, they were like, what is wrong with you? You missed this red flag, this red flag, this red flag, this red flag, and that red flag. I would have been out of there instantly. And it really made me have to come up against this word that's sometimes kind of uncomfortable. It's a P word, it's privilege. I have the privilege of showing up in certain spaces and not having to worry about these things. I could show up at pretty much any event, show up in anybody's house, and not have to consider potential dangers. And I think that was a really big learning moment for me. I have the privilege to be stupid, which will be the title of my next book, The Privilege of Stupidity. Uh, but it really made me come up against this word that's really been uh, polarized privilege. It doesn't mean I'm a bad person. It just means that there are certain things I don't have to think about. And I needed to, as I traveled across the country talking to people who didn't have as much privilege, understand that there are extra steps that other people have to take, that not everyone can be as footloose and fancy free and gullible and trusting as I was. So I think that was a really big learning experience for me. Yeah, thank you. I, all the women in the audience were like, yeah, that's yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I'm an idiot, yeah. <laughs> well, we're happy to be here. I'm, I'm very, here. very happy to be here because uh, read up on David Parker Ray. He was not nice to his uh, guests. I will, and yeah. I will read your sequel. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, one thing that you touched on a little bit was the role of social media. You like went out to your network to find where to stay and all these cool people across the country. Um, social media is definitely a hot topic nowadays and going into the 2024 election. And one thing I found interesting working on the 2020 election is social media was huge. That was how we were able to reach people. We couldn't go door to door. It was the pandemic. We, were, we also don't really go door to door a lot nowadays because people are like, why are you in my house? Um, but social Fair. media, right? <laughs> social media did play a huge role in your journey. Um, you did mention you got a lot of feedback on Instagram when you went to the Trump rally. You are, of course, part of a generation that's just very comfortable using social media. Um, what is your opinion on the role social media plays in connecting and or dividing Americans? Well, I'll say one nice thing about social media. It's a great 
connector to get people together in person, as I mentioned earlier. Um, if you're looking for a local movie night or trying to find places to stay in all 50 states, it can be very useful. That's where the nice things end. Uh, I work for a nonprofit that supports the mental health of young people. And there are studies of the effects of social media on the brain, and it's very dangerous. And the, the first reason is it actually alters our perception of reality. The algorithms target us with a very specific version of reality. It will show us content that validates our point of view, and then it will also show us content that inflames us, that shows us something from an opposing side that makes us so angry, and then it'll show us something that validates us. And it rinse and repeat the process. And so it becomes this very polarized view of America where you don't think you could ever possibly agree with the awful people on the other side, and your version is all you're seeing besides that. So you're not getting anything in the middle. So it actually looks as though America is very divided. And America is not as divided as it seems on social media. And the second thing about social media is it's just not a very constructive place to have a political conversation. I don't know if anyone's ever tried you know, sharing a scholarly article with someone to shut down a social media feud. It just never works because the nuances of what's going on in American society do not translate to 240 characters, to Instagram stories, to the posts that perform the best, which are short declarative sentences. It just doesn't leave any room for nuance. And the third thing that's so dangerous isn't something that I've necessarily heard people talking about. Social media robs us of the ability to change our mind or to evolve. And when we post something, people assume that's where we stand. And maybe you're having a bad day or maybe you've had a few drinks. That thing's going to stick around forever. And people are going to ascribe your political views to what you're putting out there. But some of the loudest voices I met on this trip on social media were some of the first to admit, I don't really know. I don't know why I posted that. I was just having a bad day. I was feeling emotional. And people are much more willing to change their mind when you talk to them in person, much more willing than they seem on social media. And we need to normalize allowing people to change their mind. And we also need to normalize allowing people to say, you know, I don't really have an opinion on this, or I need more information, because it seems like everyone feels like they have to have an opinion, and we just don't have time to have opinions on all the things we're supposed to have opinions on without doing a lot of research that we don't do. So social media is very dangerous because it robs us of the ability to do something called lateral reading. So when you are researching a particular topic, maybe you will read something from one source. And instead of saying, all right, that's the way it is, that's my opinion, you read, topic, you read the same topic from multiple sources, uh, maybe different publications, maybe a scholarly article. Maybe you can even go to someone's Facebook page or Instagram if you want extra, extra information. But we don't do any lateral reading anymore. It's all just was delivered to us on social media, and I think that is incredibly dangerous. It, it really is. I'm very cautiously optimistic with where we're going, but also kind of terrified to see the future of social media. My, um, my final question starts before we turn it over to our group discussion. Um, it starts with a quote, so um, sorry to read you to you, but for the group. Maybe embracing the diverse states of mind in our country started with embracing our own community. I'd seen so many Americans get off social media and use their talents organizing, protesting, volunteering, teaching, painting, debating, or just listening to make their communities more cohesive and inclusive. If we could foster that small town feeling of belonging, being listened to, and having a purpose in the community, perhaps we could begin to cool down the rhetoric that had just sent our democracy into fever. From what I had seen, it didn't just seem good for democracy, it seemed to be a roadmap to fulfillment. Now, I realize this was a major aha moment for you. You said everything. Essentially, it's our relationships and connections with each other that will not only save our country, but maybe also fulfill our purpose as humans. After your book tour, I know you're wrapping up in Medford tomorrow. Do you still feel this way? And is there anything you would elaborate on this point? Well, I'm glad you referenced the book tour because the best thing about writing this book has been coming to communities like this all across the country. I actually feel like I've learned so much more about America actually having these conversations, and I wish I could go back and rewrite the entire book or write another one. Maybe these library visits will go in the privilege of stupidity or whatever it's called. <laughs> 
But I'll be honest, there are days where I do not feel optimistic, where I feel beaten down, where I feel like you know maybe we are hopelessly divided. Unfortunately, now I've written a book that makes my whole brand being optimistic, but I do sometimes feel like it is a little futile. But then I think that you know I've got 60-ish good years left of being an American on this planet, and I realize that there's no time for me to be despondent. I have to believe that we can make a difference and turn the page on this sad, divisive period in American history. And I realize that hope is a choice. Community is a choice. And division is a choice. And if we can choose to see the good, if we can choose to show up and have conversations with people in our community, if we can choose to reach out to people with whom we disagree or with whom we might have broken, if we can choose to be united, I think that is going to create a huge sea change in this country of just people changing their mindsets of how we approach politics, how we approach these issues. And I think that is what is going to build an America that is collaborative, compassionate, and constructive. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. So we did have a couple of questions that we kind of wanted the group to think about, either in a group setting discussion or when you're driving home tonight. Um, I definitely, they kind of touch a little bit on what's in the book, but also just where we are at as Americans today. Um, I'll start, maybe you can read the next one. Yeah. Is, um, number one, how has your upbringing affected your worldview as an American, as it relates to politics? <laughs> yeah. No pressure. <laughs> yeah. And if you also, in the meantime, if you have any questions for me as you ruminate on those things, happy to answer, because uh, I have a few of the, the you know, high pay grade questions that may take a second to think about. So if you have any questions for me about the trip, happy to answer. Who are you as a human? Yeah. It's better not reading it, let me tell you. Okay. It's, it's, the talk is way better than the book. I can have an opinion. Yes. <laughs> um, I'm assuming you've met with more than one person in every state that you can. Um, what was the, did, did you see any difference in attitude within socioeconomic uh, stratas or um, different uh, minority demographics? Um, did you find that there was sort of a consistency with people who, with everybody, or was there a definitive or even theoretical differences in how they see things based on their gender, or their race, or their socioeconomic level? I would love to answer that question with a reading. Could I just read something really quickly? I think that might, because Every time I, I've been asked questions like that before, and I'm just like, I could speak in generalities, or I can read something. And I think reading something will be um, probably the most helpful. So this is, from a, um, this is from a chapter in Ohio. Uh, so I went to a, a bar in Cleveland that was in one of the rather more high crime areas in the city. And it was a bar called Skeets. And I'm just going to read this chapter, what I learned. It was an after-work crowd inside Skeets. The appearance of two white guys in the all-black bar was not as nonchalant as I had hoped. We sat at the bar, waiting for Ram. I smiled back as people gave us curious nods or just stared. I'm glad I didn't make this a documentary, I thought, picturing rolling up to the bar with a camera crew. Recording already gave a slight edge to conversations, and I couldn't imagine shoving a camera in someone's face and expecting them to be totally candid. There was no way to communicate that I was there to learn, not pull a stunt. And the question of, what, are, what the hell are you doing here, was very clear in every suspicious glance thrown our way. Finally, Ram arrived. We ordered drinks, and the three of us sat in the bar, talking amongst ourselves, struggling to break our invisible barrier. This is why people don't leave their comfort zones, I realized. It can be awkward. 
Austin and Ram were shifting uncomfortably, taking cues off of my unease. I wasn't going to set the tone for the next 49 states by being timid. I took a deep breath and turned to the man sitting next to me and said, how's your day going? He smiled and shook his head, amused that I had finally started to talk. What are you doing here, man? I looked around the bar where everyone was watching me out of the corner of their eye. I'm traveling to all 50 states to talk to people about their communities. All 50 states. Yeah, and Ohio is my first stop. The man gave me a high five, and he chose the best place in Ohio. Suddenly, people who had been watching us from around the bar started gathering. What brings you here? He wants to hear about the neighborhood. You want to hear about the neighborhood? We'll tell you about the neighborhood. I discovered that I was surrounded by sheet metal workers, mechanics, and veterans who had lived in the area for decades, some for their whole lives. Everyone I talked to seemed excited that I had chosen Skeets as a place to showcase the Ohio state of mind. Rio, a straight shooter in a hoodie, stood and listened as the older folks at the bar told me how they had grown up with the Hollywood actor Bill Cobbs and how his success had made him an icon of hometown pride. After listening to this, Rio approached and told me that he admired my hustle and asked if I wanted to step outside for a recorded interview that didn't sugarcoat things. Outside, the streets were dark. Rio told me he didn't want me getting a falsely rosy impression of the neighborhood and asked candidly what I was looking for at Skeets. The real Cleveland, I said, holding up my recorder. He nodded and pointed across the street at a bar called Cheers. Somebody got kidnapped over there three weeks ago. Dude was coming out of the bar. They pulled up in a van, beat the hell out of him with a pistol, shot him in the head two times. He lived. Down the street right there, a little girl got off the bus from school, got snatched, killed, put under a porch, 14 years old. So how does this end? It doesn't. Not ever. In this area, it's not. Because poverty is poverty. Like, who's to say we're going to wake up tomorrow? And that's how we're living. That's all it is. It's about right now, Rio continued. If you ain't got a right now, you ain't got nothing here. I returned inside, shaken but thankful for Rio's commitment to candor. Though I was distracted by what I had learned, my reappearance inside the bar did not go unnoticed. I was approached by a bartender with closely cropped hair, Denise. She offered to show me a hand-painted mural in the backyard. I agreed. She took me by the hand and led me through the crowded bar, shouting, excuse me, every few steps. In the backyard, Denise stood in a leather jacket and pointed out the faces of the mural of both national and local black celebrities. Denise recounted the history of the mural with a palpable sense of pride as I recorded. She gestured to the bar. This is all we have. Tomorrow is not promised to any of us. It's only by the grace of God that you're going to be here, and you should try to enjoy life while you're here, because we don't know how much time we have left. I would prefer to love, and that's why I love this place. Denise's voice shook with emotion. It's all about love, all about acceptance, all about knowing that a person's going through something just like I'm going through something. And I know I can come here and release it a little. Just because by Johnny Taylor started playing inside the bar, someone cheered. Do you think if there was a skeets in every neighborhood in the United States that we'd live in a better country? I asked. Denise grinned. Yes, we would. I thought of the occasional isolating feeling of not having somewhere I belonged while living in the big cities. I think a lot of people feel like they don't have a place to go like this. They don't have a place that feels like family, I said. And that makes me sad, she said. And she looked it. Some people would say I'm just a bartender, but I refuse to close this, close this place on a holiday because I know that I might have a customer who doesn't have anywhere to go. I cook every holiday. If I see someone walking down the street that might not have something to eat, I say, come get yourself something to eat because I couldn't rest thinking someone didn't have anywhere to go or didn't have a hot meal. We're going to feed them, not just me. No, we're going to feed them. It's what we do, baby. As we walked inside, I told Denise that today was my first full day of the trip and how welcome I felt despite being nervous about jumping into the unknown for the next five months. She shook her head and shouted at me over the swelling chorus of Just Because. You take this love you have here, she said, pointing at my chest like she was conjuring a talisman. You'll meet some assholes, but everything's going to be fine if you keep this love and don't you forget it. She gave me a hug and disappeared behind the bar to greet a regular who had just walked through the door. I looked across the bar to Austin and Ram, who were laughing and clinking their glasses with a group of 70-year-old men in welders' uniforms. There wasn't a lonely person in sight. Thank you. There were so many emotions in just a few pages there. That was that's, 
That's America, baby. I'm very emotional. Yeah. Oh, wow. That was fantastic. I had a lot of, I want to make sure I open up to questions as well. Did that answer your? It's great. I mean, it just, yeah, it's familiar. So, uh, yes. <laughs> it was a fantastic question. Thank you. Is the white supremacist movement as big as you would get the impression listening to the media? I don't know if I can comment on that. I'm not. I'm not sure. I know that I didn't meet any in my travels, um, but I also wasn't on the prowl for the <laughs> WSs. Yeah, I mean, there's. A, I definitely experienced some casual racism from people, and not not very often. But a, a guy who was cutting my hair made a few comments and. What do you do? You know, like I, I was like, I was in this situation. I'm like, do I start yelling at him halfway through my haircut? Is he gonna stop cutting my hair? How much do I tip him? <laughs> and I think those are the really uncomfortable questions that we all have to ask as Americans. Is like, how do we show up when we hear something that is, you know, racist and awful, where the other person we can hope that they can learn something. We hope that they can come out the other side and it, it is that we can affect each other positively to hold people accountable. Because a lot of people are the products of where they come from. You know, not everyone has the privilege of having met a wide variety of people. And I think that's the thing we have to consider, especially as we travel and as we have the belief that we can make the world more inclusive and that we can affect each other positively. Like, how do we get people to reevaluate long-held beliefs? That's the best I can do with that question. I know we're, we're running a little close to our time. I, I have a million questions I wish I could ask. I think what I do really am curious about is um, you had mentioned everyone showing off their hometown and what they thought made it special. What would you show off from your hometown? Well, I uh, after this trip, I moved to Kansas City, Missouri. Uh, after living in the largest city in America, I moved to the 34th largest city. And so there's this memorial in Kansas City that looks out over uh, the skyline. And it's actually the place where I fell head over heels in love with this town. I'd never visited before I was on this trip. And I stood there at my 50th state in Missouri, and I just totally fell in love with this town. And it is a uh, a gathering place for people. And there aren't a lot of gathering places, uh, especially in the Midwest and especially around the country. Out east, I think there are a lot, the cities were built to have squares and gathering places for people. But it's a place where every Memorial Day, every 4th of July, people from all over the city, from all over the metro area can come for free, lay down their blankets, watch the fireworks. You don't need to belong to a country club. You're in a, you know, a safe, fun environment, and I think that really encapsulates the best of America, inclusive common spaces where people can come together and celebrate you know, American milestones, meet people from different backgrounds, run into, run into their neighbors, but also run into someone from a different part of town. And so I think that's my, my very favorite thing because of what it represents, this melting pot of our communities. Great question, thank you. What would you show off? I'm from Patchogue, Long Island. Oh, sure. Patchogue is such a, um, we're right in between, we're in the center of Long Island. And it's similar to, I'm sure, many places in your book, very progressive and very Trump -y. It's right <laughs> on that line. And um, I don't, I, it's just a bit too corny. I would show off my library, because that's just like where I loved growing up. And everyone, I think what you mentioned of inclusive spaces, that's where I felt most included and where mm. we have a 70% Hispanic demographic there. And it was just such a empowering community space. It's what drove me to become a librarian today. And I would show up a library. Don't be too corny. I love that. I mean, they really are important spaces for community building, for conversations. There's a section in there I won't read it right now, but it's all about the importance of libraries in Delaware. So I'm a big library stan. 
We are too. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you all so much for coming. Are there any questions we can answer? Um, aside from your experience in truth or consequence in New Mexico, which the levels of irony to that I really appreciate. <laughs> um, <laughs> is there, was there anywhere that you went that kind of made you question the optimism that you have about traveling and meeting people? And yeah, and no, no tea, no shade. Um, <laughs> but when I was in Oklahoma, and the more I found out about the Oklahoma City bombings and the, the dangerous, paranoid thinking that led to that event and doing more research about that part of American history, uh, the conspiracy theories that lead to violence. And then I actually went to uh, Tiger King Joe Exotic's uh, Tiger Farm, which was a very depressing place. <laughs> but it was the, we were right off the high. We were like, OK, let's, let's see what this is all about. When I was in Oklahoma, I, I felt that I was really up against some of the more difficult legacies of being an American, but it was ultimately something that I was able to talk with the people uh, I stayed with in Oklahoma about to reckon with it and then learn more about. But you know, the thing about America and every single country in the world is like the people who live in it, none of us are perfect. None of these countries are perfect. All of us have, you know, dark, dark parts of our past. Uh, me as a human especially, uh, but I think being able to reckon with those and look at them head on even when it's uncomfortable and even when it's scary can allow us to, you know, if not accept certain parts, to say, well, we're going to learn from this going forward. We're going to turn this into a, a lesson. And that's how I started thinking about the things that made me feel discouraged, that we're not going to repeat these, these dangerous, dangerous parts of our history, if I can help it. Thank you so much for being here, Ryan. Oh, such a pleasure. Thank you all. Thank you for being here.